we all know how short life is. I mean, the mortality rate is still tracking at 100% the last time I checked. And even though this life is short, we still don't want it to suck. This podcast is all about tools and insights from psychology, philosophy, and spirituality to help this journey suck less. In fact, we may even learn how to embrace the life we have while creating the life that we want. My name is Morgan, and this is the PS We Expire podcast. I'm so glad you're here. Where did you get your sexual ethic? I think many of us remember having the talk with our parents when we were kids, but that didn't even lay the foundation of what our sexual ethic is. We were exposed to so many things before we ever had any formal kinds of conversations with our parents. So maybe you got your sexual ethic, which would be defined as how you view the morality of sex and sexual expression, sexual identity from movies, books, TV, any place on media. And if you happen to grow up in a religious household, a conservative religious household in the 80s and 90s and a little bit beyond, you probably got a big chunk of your sexual ethic from purity culture. I invited Dr. Tina Shermer Sellers onto my podcast today to talk about what exactly sex is, <laughs> how we develop a sexual ethic for ourselves. And one of the biggest questions about how do we deal with our deep-seated shame around sex, any shame that we have about our bodies, the things that have happened to us, any kind of sexual trauma. Um, and we talk specifically about the phenomenon of purity culture and like what exactly did life look like before that kind of weird political slash religious in bed together phenomenon that happened in the 80s and 90s and how her work changed over time. She shares a lot about her personal experience about how she got into becoming a sex therapist and a lot of the things that she does now in teaching parents how to have sex positive households and how to unshame conversations about sex. So Dr. Tina Shermer Sellers is a licensed sex and gender feminist psychotherapist, best-selling author, researcher, emeriti professor, and media personality whose expertise spans sex therapy, spiritual intimacy, parenting, and social, social justice. She has a book out called Shameless Parenting, Everything That You Need to, to Raise Shame-Free, Confident Kids, and Heal Your Shame Too. And she has a great book called Sex, God, and the Conservative Church, Erasing Shame from Sexual Intimacy. Her work isn't just for people who are maybe have come out of purity culture and are no longer part of any religious affiliation, but this is also for people who are still believers in a sexual ethic that can be coexistent with their beliefs in God and how to explore our sexuality, how to have good conversations in our relationships to create more intimacy, not just about sex, but about intimacy in our relationships. So this, this wide ranging conversation, um, we had a great time talking with each other. And I know that not only is this episode going to be helpful to you, if, if you are exploring these topics as well, but also the work that she has done, the free resources that she has, all of which are linked in the episode notes. So please, Please go ahead and take advantage of everything that's available today for free as you seek to parent your children in really sex positive ways, in body positive ways. And as Dr. Tina and I talk about the downstream effects of having an outdated or shame filled um, view towards sex and sexuality and intimacy with ourselves and also intimacy in our most deep personal relationships. So thanks for joining me for this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you so much for joining me on this episode today. I cannot wait to delve into sexual shame. <laughs> like right off the bat, we're going to talk about that. We're going to talk about um, raising children in a sex positive household. We're going to talk about integrating our spiritual practices, our religious beliefs into um, our sexual lives, which I think many people, especially who are either in a religious context or were raised in religious context, think that those cannot mesh, that they're like oil and water. So I'm excited to delve into that today too. Um, but before we do, can, can you talk to me about how you came to this work and what, what your work with people looks like now? Um, and, and where you, where you got to where you are, how you got to where you are right now? Yeah. Thanks Morgan. It's so nice to be here with you. 
Um, it's a real circuitous story, honestly. Um, and it has its roots in the fact that I grew up in a Swedish immigrant home, which unbeknownst to me was body and sex positive. Just meaning that my grandparents, my parents, my aunts, my uncles, everybody just recognized that everyone has a body, a body is good, a body is what allows us to love. And so as my questions or curiosities came up or I expressed them or did the kind of things that kids do, somebody was there to say, oh yeah, that's your vulva. It's a wonderful part of you. We take care of it. Or, oh yeah. Um, do you, you know, I can remember my dad saying when I was like 14, fifth, no, I had to be older than that, 15, 16. I was talking about a friend of mine that I was going to go out with and, and he's like, wait, no, I guess must have been a junior in high school. And he said, no, wait, you know what um, he means if any guy ever says to you, he wants to feel your pecs. And I laughed at my dad and I'm like, <laughs> yes, dad, of course I know that. I'm not naive, you know, but these were just ongoing, constant conversations that we had. And to me, it was no different than talking about a recipe or mm. what the difference in healthy food is and what it means to be a good friend and how we treat people. I mean, it was just part of the evolution of the conversations in our home. I was literally in my thirties before I realized I grew up in a very different home from most people. I came to call it a sound bite sex home because you just, it was sound bites and it was all the time, you know, and it was normal. And, and it was all the, all my relatives, all my Swedish relatives. So, um, so I started out my career as a junior high and high school teacher, listening to kids, realizing that so much of what was going on at home was impacting their ability to learn. I ended up in grad school to be a family therapist so I could help with the family, supporting the family system so they could support the child. That took me into a lot of stuff having to do with, with medicine, like the impact of psychosocial, psychosocial illnesses or illnesses on our psychosocial health. And, um, but meanwhile, I started teaching after I got my degree, I started teaching in an accredited marriage and family therapy program. One of the courses that they had, which was a required course for licensure as a marriage and family therapist, was a graduate level human sexuality course. And nobody wanted to teach it. Nobody on our faculty, we had a small faculty, nobody wanted to teach it. And I was like, oh, I'll teach it. I would love to teach it, you know? And when I had been teaching junior high and high school, I was always the one that had the secret question box or whatever, whatever. So I started teaching that class in 1992. And now this was a class that I also had taken and that somebody else had taught. They actually had it off campus. That's how uncomfortable they mm. were with the class. Um, so one of the things I had my students do was write their sexual autobiography. So I gave them like 60 or so questions that had them look at their family of or families of origin, their childhood, adolescence, young adulthood, you know, whatever, and just ask them to reflect on it and then to look at the legacy that they could see in the arc of the story. We don't really, most people don't really know what their sexual autobiography is. They remember episodes like, oh, I remember getting in trouble when I was five or, oh, I remember my first kiss or I remember coming out or you know, like there are these spot things, but it's not really a narrative with an arc. And so once they had written it, then they could look at it and say, oh, so what's been the influence of this? What's been the legacy of this? How do I feel about it? What do I really believe in now? Because I would tell them you're only ever as good a therapist as you know your own stories mm -hmm. where you begin and end and your clients begin and end. So you don't get those things confused, which is important, ethically important. Around the year 2000 or so, so eight years after teach, starting to teach this class, I started to notice this dramatic shift in the tone of these autobiographies. Like they started, you know, using really negative language about themselves, feeling disgusted about themselves, feeling like they were perverted, like feeling really embarrassed to tell me, you know, whatever, in, in, you know, in the writing. And I thought their stories aren't significantly different at all. I mean, they're still describing, you know, having their first crushes around the same time, you know, master starting to masturbate around the same time, you know, it's all, all falling in this sort of range of common. 
so I couldn't figure out where this negativity was coming from. It took me about three years. I literally would be in tears reading these mm-hmm. because I was so heartbroken that these people who were precious to me were feeling so awful about something so wonderful about themselves, their curiosity, their desire, all wonderful, all a, all a gift in my book. And so I'd be writing on the edges of these papers. Oh, sweetheart, you know, mm-hmm. and um finally about three years into this change, I realized what I was getting was the first wave of students born in the, usually in the eighties somewhere. And they came of age around in the nineties, 92 to 97, somewhere in there, they came in their adolescence. And this was the height of the abstinence only and really where it hit its tipping point across the United States. We started pumping Monday into it in the eighties, but really around the early nineties, did we see, you know, and then at the same time we had the religious right and the moral majority in bed with the Republican party and they made abstinence only education, which was religious education. They made it across the United States. There was an absolute merging of church and state that happened in the politics, socio-political climate at that time. It still is that way now. Um, And so you could have come from a religious conservative home and gotten this at school, at your private school and at youth group, or you could have not been in a religious home and gotten it at your school. Mm. You were getting the same messages. And the message was that sex is dangerous, it's going to kill you because remember we had AIDS hit the East coast mm. in 80 and the West coast in 85. It's going to kill you. It's going to ruin your future. You're going to end up with diseases. You're and if then the religious stuff would be, you're going to ruin your relationship with God. You're going to ruin a relationship with your future partner, you know, and these kids were so young still. And so they thought, Oh my gosh, I should make everything stop. It's not don't have sex before marriage. It's don't think about it. Don't feel it. Don't want it don't do anything, shove it down. There were other messages too. And again, these were cultural, sociopolitical and religious that were coming at the same time. And there were things like boys are dangerous. They can't Mm. help themselves. They are not to be trusted, right? Girls, you're responsible. You make them stumble. You're responsible. If a guy comes after you, then it's something you're wearing, something you looked, something you did, something, whatever. And so girls got this extra message of you're dangerous, your sexuality is dangerous, and it's your fault if anything happens. And then boys get this message, you know, well, boys will be boys, right? And you're not really responsible for the impact of your behavior. We still see both of those messages very loud and clear in our religious, conservative religious circles and in our sociopolitical world, right? So this now has been going on for well over 40 years, and it has created the rape culture that we have. And meanwhile, we've made products more important than people, while we continue to say families and, you know, family values, and we care about the family. No, we don't. There's no real time, money, or policy going into protecting families, not in healthcare, not in education, not in support for new moms, you know, postpartum support, um, young child support. No. So that's a long way to say I got hooked because the pain was so great. And I thought the injustice was, was almost too much for me. Mm -hmm. So I was like, we got to start talking about this. We got to start dealing with it. And I am old enough that I don't really care. You know, if people come <laughs> after me, I'm like, it's okay because mm-hmm. the evidence is right there in front of us and we have to talk about it. As someone who grew up exactly dead center to the time period that you're talking about, coming of age in the late 90s, it's hard for me to imagine a world where it wasn't like that. And so, you know, as much as I like am cognitively aware that that's not how it always was, like, I think I had this belief that, you know, because of the, how the United States was founded on, you know, particular, a particular set of values, I just kind of assumed that historically it's always been like that. 
And so it's difficult for me to kind of wrap my head around the fact that no, it didn't used to be like that at all. And this no. mingling of the, the political climate and the, and the ways that, that people in politics saw an in with a particular demographic to say, oh, this is how we can, you know, garner this vote. We're yes, going to make yes. that message loud and clear so that we have more political, you know, a foothold in these particular populations. Right. So, so when, what I thought was so interesting is that you said that the, the stories weren't changing. The timelines for these kids was the same. The discovery of themselves, the crushes, all of that was happening along the same timeline. Yes. But the, what it means is what was being changed. And so what I hear in that is like, that humans are humans <laughs> across yeah. the spectrum and within human development, particularly in early childhood, these milestones are the same and they are normal, but what we are taught about them or as parents or educators, what we are teaching children about them has shifted. So how, oh man, so many questions I have here about how to like start to unpack for ourselves areas yeah. where shame and sexual shame in particular kind of live in our bodies and what is the what's the downstream effect of not addressing these these narratives and these stories that we carry with us yeah well that's such good questions morgan the downstream effects are dramatic um and devastating and re ridiculously common so much so that we don't even see them people think oh that's normal the amount of strife in and i'm going to say in particular in heterosexual relationships because a lot of queer relationships they've been working hard to figure out who they are to have voice to find their people you know to figure out what good good relationship and sexuality and attachment can all looks like. I mean, they're just, they're all working so hard, but there's this way in which often straight folks are, straight cis folks are sort of drinking the water, just a hook, line and sinker and breathing the air of what's happening inside a, a, our particular culture and, and religion. And, and so they're, they're getting this secondary learning which actually maybe is more primary because it's coming through our media and, mm -hmm. um, and then we're, our homes are relatively silent, but, you know, I would have so many students that would say to me, you know, I don't, I never saw my parents be affectionate and they came to my games and they came to my, my teacher conferences or whatever, but I actually never saw them be affected. I never saw their marriage. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until they were splitting up that I realized that. This was ridiculously common. Well, we pit the way that culturally, the way that we raise our boys and the way that we typically raise our girls pits them against each other, gives them uh, skill sets that actually are more difficult to work in an intimate relationship, hmm. right? And, and we give them all these capitalistic ideas, right? Like if it's not suiting you, get a new one, <laughs> right? Well, that's not how relationships work. You know, relationships are there to help you. What I say, grow up, show up and shape up. And so they're wonderful when you're getting along. That's what I call a vacation, you know, just take a deep <laughs> breath and enjoy it. But when you're not getting along, what's actually happening is your partner's holding a mirror up to you about something you need to grow in. Mm. And you might be doing the same thing. <clears throat> and so you guys are doing this. If you're blaming, you can guarantee you're going to stay in the same place because you both need to grow evolution needs to keep happening. So you need to look at your stubbornness or you need to look at your inability, your, your reactivity, your self-esteem. You need to look at your stuff. And if you do, you'll both keep growing and your relationship will keep evolving and love will grow deeper. This is the human element of intimacy of, of we keep choosing bonding, even though it's the hardest thing we do. Right. But I think it's innate. I mean, I think we're being invited into a spiritual practice of growth and learning. We don't talk about it that way, but when you do enough therapy, you start to see it, right? You start mm -hmm. to see that that's, that's what's happening. So um, 
I don't know if I'm getting at your question or not. You want to steer me again? Yeah, you totally are. What, um, what you were just talking about with like the in, in relationships, particularly in our most intimate relationships, people get to see you in a way that nobody else does. It's like, I can keep my shit together when I'm out in public, but when I'm at home and someone sees me when I'm most tired, when I'm worn out, like that's when they're going to see those parts of me that I'd like to keep hidden from somebody else. But the tricky part, the tricky part is in those intimate relationships. If shame exists there, you will always be on the defensive always right. because it's too painful to go into the places of shame and look at them. That's right. Yeah. Because remember, fundamentally shame makes us feel like we are unworthy of love, of belonging, of being desired, cared for, protected, all of it. I don't know if you've heard the definition of, of sexual shame, but we didn't have it mm. until 2017. It was our first piece of research on it. And, um, uh, uh, uh a scholar named Noel Clark, Dr. Noel Clark did a beautiful piece of research and out of it. And the bulk of the people that she interviewed did not have religious backgrounds. So this is part of what makes her the definition so stunning, but it's our first operational definition of sexual shame. I'm going to go ahead and read it to you so that you and your listeners can hear it. Because when you ask the question, what's the downstream effect? What's the impact? Sexual shame actually affects us at our most tender, important place. It affects us at our ability to do attachment, to give and receive love. If we can't do that well, we will go to our deathbed lonelier than we could have been, less attached and connected than we could have been. So to me, I don't know how you hurt somebody more than to hurt them there. That's why I think this has become such a crusade for me is because I want to see people liberated so that they can begin to experience life from a place of not only am I worthy, I'm a divine expression of creativity and abundance. Me, Mm. I am, and you are, and you are, and that's why we're different. And you are. And the more we live into that understanding, that awareness, the more we bring our goodness into the world, which the world needs, right? But we can't do that until we shed some of this stuff. So here's the definition. Sexual shame is a visceral feeling. So in your body, a visceral feeling of humiliation and disgust toward one's own body and identity as a sexual being and a belief of being abnormal, inferior, and unworthy. This feeling can be internalized. So in our insides, like in a you know, critic or whatever, but it also manifests. And I will say it first manifests in interpersonal relationships. So between the, the infant actually, and the Mm -hmm. other, you know, um, having a negative impact at this on trust, communication, and physical and emotional intimacy, sexual shame develops across the lifespan. So it starts the moment most kiddos are finding their genitals and they're Mm -hmm. a year old you know, right then and there in interactions with interpersonal relationship, then one's culture and society, which is always telling you you're not good enough. So you keep purchasing things. Right. And then subs and then creates a subsequent critical self appraisal, which is like a continuous feedback loop, something on our shoulder, continually reminding us how we're not worthy and no one could really love us. Goes on to say, there is also a fear and uncertainty related to one's power or right to make decisions, including safety decisions related to sexual encounters, along with an internalized judgment toward one's own sexual desire. That last little piece reminds me of the research work of Peggy Ornstein. She wrote a book called Girls and Sex. She wrote one about five years later called Boys and Sex. When she was working with girls, 80 girls, 15 to 22, she, she would say, so many of these girls feel confident and competent in every area of their life until they get ready to go out. Hmm. And then they're putting down three, four, and five shots of hard liquor hmm. because they don't know if they can keep themselves safe or if they have the right to. So this is how pervasive, why I say it's a socio-political movement. This isn't just conservative religions. Conservative religion is inside our political environment 
pretending to be doing good, but it's really about getting more money for us, for the wealthy, for those who are the stockholders, the blah, 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 blah. It's a such an incredible front, but it's been working for the wealthy. And so it keeps going. Um, and there's not, there's not a high value in integrity in our country at all. You know, it's, it's very much there and it lives in certainly in people that you and I both know, but it's not, it's not at the upper level um, leadership places where we, where we really need it. So when you say, what's the downstream effects, imagine we now have a society of people who are living their lives, not knowing what magnificent miracles they are, feeling horrible about who they are, putting on a mask and becoming who the world tells them to become, purchase more things, buy more things, look good, you know, do all the things, you know, right? And then they're doing that pretending, not receiving love because if somebody loves them, they think inside, well, they're not really loving me. They're loving this mask. They wouldn't love me if they knew me. And the love that they give, they're giving from this fake place. They're living their whole lives this way, having babies, burying friends, burying parents, getting older, only to be at the later stages of their lives and realizing it was all a scam to keep late stage capitalism going in a way that was hurtful, not heartful, mm. right? I mean, we could be doing so many things that are so wonderful and lovely and healing and making a difference in the world. And that fills us up and gets us excited and helps us find more people that are like-minded to make the world. I mean, that is so energizing and life-giving, you know, and, and so many people are missing it. And so to me, what's the long downstream effects? I think, I think we're seeing it. We're seeing it every day around us. And it's heartbreaking to me. Absolutely heartbreaking. Yeah. It's the, I mean, it, it makes perfect sense why there's a loneliness epidemic because it's when I think about sex and I don't think that I've thought about it in this way until this conversation, but the way that I was always talked to about, um, sexuality is, is primarily around a sexual act. But when you're defining, when you're reading this really amazing, clear definition about what sexual shame is, it's not just about the act of having sex. It's how you, how you function in intimacy in every area of your life. And I think about some of the the common complaints for like a, a heterosexual couple in particular, where, you know, he's saying we're not having enough sex. And she's saying, you're not helping around the house enough. And like, they seem disconnected, but what many people miss out on is that all, all of this is an act of intimacy and showing up for the other person's needs Yes, yes, yes. yes in a yes. way that isn't completely self-sacrificial because that also is, is not good, but happens to play into the patriarchy really well, really well. <laughs> for women to be completely self-sacrificing. Mm -hmm. um, but it boils down to like, how, how do we be vulnerable with each other at yeah. the most intimate levels? Because if I can't be emotionally or spiritually naked with someone yeah. else, yes, that yes, will yes. absolutely impact how I can be physically naked with someone else. That's right. Absolutely. That's such a good point. You know, um, I just feel like there's, there's so much around how we as people can learn to deal with our stuff. You know, like if you can begin to go like, how much of me believes that my body is good and wonderful and beautiful? How much of me believes that I am good, beautiful and wonderful if you can feel yourself pushing away from those ideas, that's shame. That's mm -hmm. what you acquired. Hang around a playground and watch three-year-olds, four-year-olds, five-year-olds for a while. And you'll realize we did not come into the world that way. You know, my, my granddaughters put on the goofiest clothes every day and they want everyone to see it, mm -hmm. right? They just think, they think they are everything. And I, and I want them to think that they're everything for as long as they can, but I know the world that they're growing up in, right? Our shame can keep us from being truly celebratory about ourselves and other people. 
So in relationships, I think what we often see is we've got patriarchy is not serving anybody. It's not serving men either, right? They get a very fractional idea of what sex is. Again, very act focused, very them focused, right? In media. And yet men are often really, heterosexual men are often really wired around, I want to feel like I'm making you happy. I want to mm. feel like I'm providing, like that's what gives me a big charge, right? But all their media is telling them, no, no, it's really about you. And so, and then the only emotions you're allowed to have, right, are anger, right? And so you have these superficial relationships with your friends. You have maybe a little more of a real relationship with your partner, but still there's so much of you that you hide. The only language you know to say around sex is, how come we're not doing it? It's been so long, right? She's grown up believing that all you want is her vagina anyway, hmm. and that you don't care about anybody but yourself. She's been told this forever. She's also been treated really poorly by men. Most women, by the time they're in their 20s and 30s, can tell you of at least one experience that was unwanted. I mean, the percentages are way higher than we talk about, way higher. Most kids, you say, girls, you say, when was the first time you were whistled at? Hmm. And it scared you. Nine. Yeah, nine. A sweet kiddo playing in the front yard right? And all of a sudden, oh, whoa, I'm not safe. I'm not safe, right? So she's thinking all this about him. She's grown up thinking it's dangerous anyway. And I'm now supposed to give it to him. That's what I've been told. So now we've set up obligation. We've set up transaction at the very place where we could be playing with each other, hmm. and getting some relief from how hard life is, Right. Sex is not, and this is where, you know, again, it comes back to heterosexual so often, sex is not penis and vagina intercourse. We know that, be good sex, because if you have ever had bad penis and vagina intercourse, it's not all good. <laughs> so then you have to ask yourself, well, what is good sex and what's the purpose, right? The purpose seems to be, when people stop and think about it, I'm going to hear this all the time. Well, some kind of connection and some kind of fun or pleasure that we're both having together. Okay, let's just get a piece of poster board and start writing mm -hmm. anything that to you feels connecting and pleasurable. Anything, anything that you probably wouldn't do with anybody else but your partner, right? Now you have a smorgasbord to choose from. You write those things down. And now you're not having Cheerios for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. <laughs> right? uh, yeah. you're like oh you know what this is what I feel like you feel up for that sure yeah or no not that but this what does that feel oh okay yeah yeah it's about connection and pleasure it's about being able to do that with yourself and with each other in your lifetime it's a gift just like finding your genitals was a gift it's a gift mm -hmm. but we have turned it into this uh, you know, I mean, I've talked to so many men, like, what's it like for you to have sex with her? And she doesn't really want to. I mean, how do you know? How can you tell? He goes, she's not even behind her eyes. Like, I can just feel it. But I think if I didn't have sex with her, then I wouldn't ever, she wouldn't ever touch me. Like, we'd never touch each other. Mm -hmm. Like, we hardly touch each other now. And I'm like, okay, can you trust me? We're going to take bad sex off the table and we're going to learn to rebuild actual things, ways of being with each other that you both want, where you can show up heart open, eyes open, aware, honest. And most men that I've worked with have been like, hell yes, yeah, sign me mm. up. I don't care how long it takes. I just miss her. And I'm so lonely in my life. And she's got the kids and she's got her friends and she's got, but not me. I don't. So patriarchy is not serving anyone. I'm so glad that you brought that up because it's, it's easy for us to be like, as the pendulum has swung necessarily into women being able to have rights that they haven't had through yep. most of history, that it can, it can almost become this like 
sense of like, well, too bad. It's hard for you. Like, you know, like, oh, you poor men, like it's hard for you now. Like it's been hard for us instead of looking at the ways that we're lonely together and being like, I can still validate your pain and what you're going through without making that mean less about my own pain. And when, can we just like, just for the sake of (laughs) this conversation, can we talk about what sex is? Because you right away, you said sex is not penis and vagina intercourse. And that is exactly what I was taught that sex was for my entire life. I remember being seven and asking my mom, you know, the question because we didn't talk about stuff in my household right on time by the way (laughs) oh good I'm so glad to hear that because I have often wondered as many people do like was I normal that I was interested in these things at these ages yes absolutely so when I when I asked my mom about it and she basically only told me the mechanics of the penis goes in the vagina part of me was like that sounds cool whoa I want to know more about that but I distinctly remember pretending like I was grossed out by it because I felt like that's what was the expected response. So from a very young age being taught that that is what sex was, which we, I really am looking forward to like us segueing into, um, other types of sex and relationships as we talk about LGBTQ and transgender and all of that, because of course that is absolutely tied into this puritanical idea about what sex is. But just for the sake of this conversation, can you define what sex is? Let's have the, give me the talk right now. Yeah. So I will tell you (laughs) sex is when two people want to share an intimate exchange with each other where both of them come away from that exchange feeling more connected and more like they shared something fun and pleasurable together. Um, and, and so what is intimate? Intimate can be all kinds of things, right? It just feels like you're bringing more vulnerability of yourself. Now, for many people that involves, may involve sharing parts of their body. It may involve sharing parts of their heart parts of their dreams, their ideas, you know, staying, but it's a vulnerability of stepping into a place together. One of the things I've learned from the King community that I love is that they sit down and negotiate everything before they do Mm. it. And there's no substances involved. Like that has to be off the table substances. And they sit down and they talk about basically what sounds fun to us. What do we want to experience together? They co-create an idea they agree on that idea. They have safe words that allow them to stop it at any point if they're not comfortable. That's established too. Then they start the play. And then in the middle of the play, if someone's get their juices are really going and they want to do something else too, and they bring it up, the other person will say, great idea, but we didn't negotiate it maybe next time. Hmm. Because there's a recognition that desire, passion is like an elixir. It's like a drug, but it's so important that we give consent to what we actually want to do before that gets on board. And so there's a recognition that there's another time. There's always another time. Hmm. Yeah. I don't have to do it all right now, but that what's important is that our agreements are important. So this way safety is held consent is held, boundaries are held, people's just mutual respect for each other is held. And then people get to have all kinds of experiences. And then afterwards, they can talk about what felt great, what was different than they thought, what they might want to do different next time. Hmm. I would do anything to raise our kids so that they had all of those skills going into their dating relationships, you know, so that kids weren't having experiences that were hurtful. They were having experiences that were, that taught them things, taught them what, the, what was pleasurable to them because it might be different than somebody else, right? Just where they're learning. When you talk about what so often happens in um, straight relationships in the United States now is women have been afraid of knowing their pleasure hmm. or to share their pleasure with a man. It's too dangerous. So even if she learns about herself in her own body, often there's a lot of growth that has to happen before she's in a relationship where she feels safe enough to say, 
this is okay. This isn't okay. This is what I feel like up for. And this is what I, I don't feel up for um, without the guilt and all the, all the stuff flooding in there from what she got in patriarchy. Right. And, and his ability to learn and hear how she's different. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, so I thought about like what, I love, I love the, the conversation around what you've learned from the kink community around always checking in with each other and negotiating ahead of time. And I was thinking about in this scenario that you talked about with the, the heterosexual couple where the man and the, and, and the wife are having sex and he can tell that she's not there, yeah, that she yeah. is not engaged, that she maybe is thinking in her mind, like, when is this going to be over? Right. What would happen if if he paid attention to that nonverbal communication and he stopped and he asked her, what do you need right now from me? Maybe I just need to be held. Maybe I actually need to to yell at you about something that I'm super frustrated at you with and understanding that there are so many things that are barriers to that level of deep intimacy that we're all longing for. And it's not necessarily about you (laughs) like this. There can be so many reasons why a woman doesn't want to have sex. And it doesn't mean that like, you know, because you do it wrong or you do it bad, or I don't like you or you smell bad or whatever. I mean, it could be those things, but it also could be where she's at in her monthly cycle. It could be how touched out she is because there's little children climbing all over her all day. And so what, what I'm hearing from you is that the, the sooner that we can unshame for ourselves, these stories of what our sexual identity, our, our pleasure, our self-exploration, as soon as we can unshame that, then we can start to verbalize to our, our partners, what, what this can look like together and invite them to also do that own, that, that self-exploration. And then you can explore together. And I love, I love, love, love that the word I keep hearing you use over and over again is play because it's like what we have, what we were raised with in purity culture and in some of these like, you know, puritanical religious, um, scenarios is that sex is like a heavy, solemn thing. (laughs) And it's like, (laughs) no, like this can be some of the most playful and curious and, and fun things that we have available to us as humans. Yeah. And funny. And I mean, so you know, funny. like somebody it's fart so in the middle of it. I mean, you know, like <laughs> so much. You're never seeing area. that in porn, um, unfortunately, because that is real. That is real. real. <laughs> or the of skin flapping together. Yes. Like, yes. why aren't we talking about this? Yeah, exactly. And to bring that kind of levity, to bring that kind of joy mm-hmm. into it changes the whole experience of it. Right. Yeah. You know, really you know, as we talk, I think I keep coming back to, it's the whole reason that I wrote sex, God in the conservative church and then wrote shameless parenting. It's really this whole thing. You know, people want to know what happened. How did the, Mm. how did the United States get like this? You know, like, how is this all going on? Where's, what's the history of this and how in the flip do I heal? And then is there any way that I can bring sort of my sexuality and spirituality together and was there ever anything sex positive out there in ancient history that we didn't know about you know and and so I just I needed to put this down so people could see honey nothing is wrong with you you got this stuff hook line and sinker because of the culture that you were in but now knowing this you can begin to rise above it and in the shameless book it was so much about wanting to help people. I mean, I had so many people saying, I don't want to do to my kids what was done Mm. to me. Can you help me? You know, but what the book also ended up doing that I wasn't even anticipating was people have been using the book to see what they should have gotten. And, you know, they can go through birth to two because birth to two, two to four, four to six, all the way up to 18. And then they can read the kid books and they can go, they can feel in their body, this relief, like, And I asked questions in the book, like, what would it have been like for you if somebody had read this book to you? Mm -hmm. And they're like, it would have changed everything. It would have changed everything if I knew I was normal at two and four and six and eight. If I had somebody teaching me about media literacy at eight, so I knew how to keep myself safe in the world and I knew what to talk about. To teach me about that, there are things on TV 
there are things in the world out on, on video games and on computers. Some of it's hurtful. Some of it exploits people. Some of that's pornography, but some of that is just video games and stuff that's there. And, and that is not the values in my family. And I know why those aren't the values of the family, because we don't like to hurt people. We just don't believe in it. Right. And so you can be having these conversations and you can be like, oh my gosh, my life would have been so different. And so they actually are reparenting themselves Mm -hmm. as they're going along, thinking about the children, you know, that might be in their lives. And, and that kind of healing is what I want for people so that they are, because you live a qualitatively different life when you see how precious you are. Yeah, absolutely. That's a a perfect way for us to start talking about for those of us who are parents who want to raise our children in sex positive family cultures. One thing that you already touched on right away is normalizing conversations about body parts, normalizing conversations about self-exploration and having it not have to be something so heavy where you sit down and have the talk, but that, (laughs) you know, like, yeah, there might be some questions, but you know, like you, this, this is normal conversation for us. Um, so as we're, as we're talking with our children, it, it makes sense to me that it feels like the easiest way to keep my children safe would be to push abstinence only. That makes perfect sense to me why that is such an appealing uh, path but it's not only does it completely ignore reality, (laughs) but it also introduces these, you know, these stories of of shame and wrongness. And so when we are trying to protect our children, keep our children safe without demonizing sexual identity, without demonizing our bodies, any of those things. And we're trying to raise our children in a sex positive household. What are some maybe like just a handful of points that you maybe have implemented it with your own children. I know, um, at the event that we were at together, it was so lovely to hear your daughter talk about growing up in a sex positive household. It's so awesome. So I would love to hear just some practical, very practical things that parents can do to to do this with their own children. First, I kind of want to take apart the idea if I can, if you don't mind that abstinence is what keeps our kids safe. Hmm. So what is abstinence? Abstinence is saying, honey, don't do this. Don't do these things until you're married. Period. If your child leaves your house at five or six and goes to school, you're not with them six, seven hours a day. If you haven't taught them what boundaries are, what friendship is, how you treat people, how you should be treated, how to get protection when you need it what exploitation is, how to recognize when somebody's taking advantage of you. If you haven't taught them any of those things, you're not protecting them. Right. You're not equipping them. You are throwing them to the wolves. So abstinence actually increases the chance that a child will be assaulted or will assault because they are going to learn things. They're gonna learn what the culture is teaching everyone else. And they're gonna learn that from their friends and they're gonna learn it from media. And we have a lot of media, more media this generation Mm. than the generation before. That's all it's gonna teach them. You're not teaching them anything. So if you wanna flip that on its head, if you want to protect your children, you do what you do in every other area of their life. You teach them how to eat healthy and why and what the, how the body works. You teach them about um, how to succeed in school, like how to do this well and that well, how to do their chores, why we do the chairs, why we're a part of the family. We equip them to be able to live life. We have to do the same thing in emotional intelligence and relational intelligence. And relational intelligence includes sexual intelligence right? So when kids are little, it's, it is things like body autonomy. Like, I love that you love to hug everyone. (laughs) We're going to practice asking before we do it. Mm -hmm. And it's okay. If you want someone to ask you first too. Okay. Because guess what? You own your body and they own theirs. Right. So we start with these little things that teach them about body autonomy, about 
kindness, about respect, about what it means to ask for those things and why it's important and what a good friend is and what those qualities are. It's really social emotional learning. That's what comprehensive sex education is from kindergarten through fourth grade or third grade. It's social emotional learning, all the different places, right? Once they, we hit about eight, nine, 10, we've got to also start talking about puberty and the body and body systems and how magnificent these systems are and how uh, in evolution, we might be ready to co-create or to procreate by the time we're 15. So what are the things that are happening? You're not emotionally gonna be ready to do that until maybe you're 30 because of the world we've now created but your body is going to be ready for these things. So we've got to talk about them, you know? And so we do all, we introduce these things in age appropriate ways. There is no such thing as a talk, Mm -hmm. throw that out the window. There are 100 one minute conversations and we're having them every single year, which is why I put together shameless parenting the way I did, because I'm like, you don't have to have it all figured out. And in fact, you don't have to have hardly anything figured out just if you've got kids in, coming up on these ages, go get these books and look at these websites. Try to be two years ahead of your kid. That's all. Just keep yourself moving along and then help them move along and just fill your house with really fun books that have been written that kids love to pick up. And then just sit down and read them with them or ask them, you know, is anything in here sound weird to you or surprising to you? Or, you know, you hear about this at school at all or, you know, And then sit and watch shows with them and ask them, like when you see something that doesn't jive with the values of your home, say, oh, that's interesting how that person said that. That seemed a little like cruel. What do you think? You know, Um, or like they were taking advantage of that person. What do you think about that? Or, you know, you just start talking like, who wrote that show? Do you think? Mm. You think there are cameras somewhere, you know? Who's that show for and who's it not for? What's the overall message in that commercial that was just on? You know, who, who's benefiting from that? Who isn't benefiting from that? You know, so media literacy kinds of questions. This is stuff you're just doing all the time, it, all the time. But underneath it all is this assumption, this belief that you are good, your body is good, and you are meant to be and do good in the world. You're meant to make a difference. Like, I don't know what your gifts are, but you're going to figure those out. And Mm -hmm. trust me, the world needs them, you know? So however you decide to use them, I hope it brings you joy. You know, it's just underneath it all. Does that help at all? That That absolutely helps. So what I, what I hear in that is that we don't need to panic. (laughs) We don't have to know everything about all the stages that our kids are in, but to educate ourselves enough to know what is, um, important for us to teach our children based on their biological milestones, um, that what I like, what, what you're talking about with like media literacy and asking these types of questions with our kids. I'm like, the more I can see so much, how the more that we become comfortable with curiosity and asking questions with our children that can only benefit all of our relationships, because that is foundationally what makes a good relationship is the open communication and no questions off limits. And like when our kids come to us with questions or scenarios that, you know, especially for those of us who are raised in purity culture, just make us like, like tense up, you know, it's to be self-aware enough to relax into how I feel in that moment, the discomfort that I feel and know that I have to address that so that I'm not teaching my children to also be uncomfortable with the questions they have. So self-regulate first. Yes, exactly. And then talk with them and knowing that, like, like you said, as soon as we get rid of this idea of like the one big talk, (laughs) the less pressure there is too on all of the other little conversations. So when my daughter asks me about her period, like, I don't have to be like, okay, like here it is. Here's the one time we're going to talk about this. I better get it right. It's like, this is just one conversation about this particular aspect of puberty, you know, and the, the more, the more that we can manage our own discomfort, the, the better it fosters connection and and open communication with the people that we love in our life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, kids are, um, kids can read you really, Mm -hmm. really well. 
right? Yeah, they I hate can. that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So they good can at it. You really, really well. <laughs> and so one time I had a friend that said, who also grew up in purity culture, and she said, wow, so what I try to do now is when I feel that feeling, that <clears throat> feeling, she goes, I know that's my shame. That's not them. Mm. So I got that part down. She goes, I just take a deep breath and I put on a happy face. Mm. And then I think about what I want to say. <laughs> mm. And I just laugh and I like, I love that because what you're saying is I'm here. Yeah. I'm good. You know? And then I'm not really sure how to answer that right yet. Can you give me a couple of minutes to think about that? Mm. Like that is such a good question. Or wow, that is a big question. What part of that question do you want the answer to? Like, do you want like where babies come from? Or do you want like how they get there, how they come out? Like, I don't know exactly right. what you want. Can I, what exactly are you looking for? So we just take the time to just slow down, slow it down. I've, I often will ask my kids, what, what, what do you know about that so far? Because that's like such a helpful way to gauge the information they've got. And then I can correct something if they, you know, have misinformation or I know then how, how far to go with it is <laughs> tremendously helpful. Um, we, we've thrown around this phrase purity culture a lot. And I, before we go any further, can we, can we just define what that is? And then yeah. talk about some of the insidious ways that that has affected people who have grown up in that. And, and some of the things that maybe are unique to growing up in a religious purity culture driven, um, context that, that we may need to be aware of that people who haven't grown up in that context, you know, it may be oblivious to. So what, what exactly is purity culture? And then how, what are some specific things to that? Yeah. So purity culture is the term that we've given to people who are involved in evangelical settings between 19, the late eighties, early nineties, pretty much forward. Um, and there are still pockets of this throughout the United States, often in our more conservative States. Um, and it was a very particular kind of sex is dangerous kind of thinking. Um, it was given a lot of media hype in part because of AIDS, in part because of mm -hmm. second wave feminism. This was all around this all at the same time. And we had an economic downturn. This was all in the early 80s, mid 80s. So you had what I would call a frightened public. So those in power could grab that fear and run with it. And this is when they decided to make abortion the issue. That was not the issue. It had been actually segregation, but they no longer could do that because of the passage of federal laws that wouldn't allow private religious universities to segregate anymore. So they had to come up with another issue. They came up with the issue of abortion and then they called it family values and they pushed it at the socio-political level, but at the religious level too. So for the very first time, when you say it's not always been the same, prior to 1980, people who like the Jerry Falwells of the world, the Dobsons of the world, whatever, they were, they were apolitical. They were not political. Mm. They became political beginning in 1980. And so there was this huge push in the evangelical circles for this clamp down, we're going to protect our families, we're going to protect everyone, da, 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 da. It didn't really have anything to do with any of that, because what we know now, it was about pushing capitalism and cutting the, the taxes for the wealthy and cutting regulations on banks, cutting regulations on media. We took away the regulations that were protecting the public from media at that time. I mean, it's just crazy to me. However, what people were hearing was, don't, 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 the world is dangerous you, you can't do, don't do anything. Don't do these things. Don't think about, and sex is at the, at the heart of it all. In fact, now it's going to kill you. And they took people like Josh Harris, who was 21 at the time, perfectly acting as a 21, 22 year old mm -hmm. who thinks they know it all, right? Because that's the one time you do for a few years. <laughs> so you get 30 and then you're like, oh Lord, was I a fool, right? And so good looking, very charismatic helped him write a book, right? Scared everybody half to death. Now all of a sudden dating isn't something that teaches us about ourselves and other people. It's something that sets us up for disaster. And so kids are, are told, you're gonna need to know within the first or second date if this is marriage material. If not, you need to get out of it because you will ruin your future. 
You will ruin your relationship with God. You will ruin your potential chance of having a mate. Don't touch, don't think about sex. Don't think about desire. Don't do it because all of that is dangerous until you get married. Um, so and, and dating even, you know, like I said, dating became off limits. You had to like do with this courtship thing because somehow you had somebody with you. So people just were running around scared to death. I met so many young people, men who were afraid to go out on a date because they were afraid they were going to hurt somebody because they had been mm. told so many scary things about men and sexuality, right? So many women that were afraid to go out because they were afraid of what they felt or afraid that they were going to cause something to happen, right? That were well into their late twenties at this point, And were like, oh my gosh, this 10 years of thinking this 15 years of thinking this has made it. So I am not moving in my life. I'm not moving in interpersonal relationships. Like I want to in relationships. I don't know that I'll ever get married. Like it all scares me so much. I mean, I've heard from people now that in the book came out almost seven years ago. Now I've heard from people around the globe tell me their stories and they're absolutely heartbreaking because they heard them so young and so early that they metabolize them into their cells. So the more earnest you were as a person or are as a person, the more anxious you might naturally be, the more you tended to feel that stuff way down deep inside. So for people who, who grew up in that era and grew up in purity culture and, you know, maybe got married young without Mm -hmm. any kind of either self exploration or exploration with other people. Yeah. Um, and now we're in these relationships and trying to navigate what to do now <laughs> and how yeah. to broach these conversations now with maybe someone yeah. that we've been with for a long time. Um, yeah. what are, what are some recommendations that you have for people who are just now starting to explore their own sexuality, explore their own pleasure, um, and how to broach these conversations with their partners, their spouses. Yeah, there's there's so much healing that has to happen, right? And so the the you're you're examining assumptions that you had had forever, and you're looking at what has been the effect of those things actually on me. And so there's a whole lot of feelings here, and and I'm often saying to people, if you can either put together a group of people who are also on the same journey of exploration, read books together, talk together, hold each other together. If you want to hire a therapist to come in once a Mm. month to talk to all of you guys, you know, and help you along the way. Right. Because this is just a process and it's a process of really deciding what of those beliefs have not been helpful in serving you, what beliefs you want to hold on to, what are the things you need to learn that you were denied learning, getting yourself then in that learning, that vocabulary that you need so that you can begin the conversations, do them first in less scary places, like with friends, right? Then, and have, you know, partners get in their own group, whatever, you know, but it's like, let's just start this process. And then you begin to dabble as you learn about yourself, you begin to dabble in your conversations with your partner about things. There's often so much water under the bridge. There's so much healing that needs to happen, but there's a lot of revelation that's happening too. Like people are realizing things about themselves and they're like, I don't know what to do with the fact that I I got married before I learned about what my identity is or what I really like and don't like, or what's important to me, or what kind of touch I like, like, or I had so much happen to me that I didn't want to have happen to me. Mm. Or there's been so much in our relationship that I actually haven't wanted, but haven't known that I had the right to, to say I didn't want it, right? On both sides. So, because they're fulfilling roles, they weren't being themselves, right? Their authenticity was in And so there's a, just a real process. And so in the book, I talk about healing the mess, the model for erasing sexual shame. And I say, at the very least, what you do is you do frame, name, claim, and name. And frame is get yourself a scaffolding of sex education. There's a zillion good books, 
start reading them, read them with your friends, read them with your partner, underline what's true for you. And then talk about how, what was what the different things that were true for you and the impact of those things on your life. What's a surprise? What was, what you were told that was actually wrong? Just do learning, start doing learning about how, how magnificent you are, what you actually needed to know about sexuality and relationships and interpersonal relationships. If you're straight, learn about interpersonal relationships that are straight, that are intimate and sexual and life-giving. If, <clears throat> if you're queer, learn about those. We have lots of good books around queer relationships, all different kinds. If you're, um, you're non-binary or you're trans, uh, trans, then let's learn about that too. There's all kinds of good stuff there that we can learn. I mean, I, I even just get excited. The fact that we have books for kids that just talk mm. about people and their differences now, you know, it's so great. Um, <clears throat> but do, do some of this learning together. And then after you've got the vocabulary, after you've got some of the learning, after you've got some of the constructs right in place, then you can be skin saying, well, how does this fit for you? And how does this fit for us? And what's been happening in our, what are the assumptions in our relationship? And you sort of begin to take a fresh look at your relationship. It's hard work. And if you can, again, I'd say get a therapist who works with you or as a couple or as a group of you or whatever that helps and just points you in some directions because it's a process that it's actually, I mean, almost a spiritual practice that you're going to now start weaving this into your life. And just slowly start healing and putting, you know, you're taking things out. It's like a suitcase. You're taking things out and you're putting the stuff in that you want. Um, and sometimes these are hard conversations to have. Um, I mean, I know some people who they've opted not to stay with each other. I've known people who have opted to open up their relationship for many different reasons. Um, I've known people who have a lot of people who've gone to therapy and just worked really hard on transforming themselves and their relationship. So it can have the breadth it needs to hold them all. Mm. Um, there's lots of different options in there and there, and all of those options can be good options. I know it's hard for people to hear when I say a relationship, you know, coming to an end and then moving into a two home family that that could be a good thing. It actually can be a really good thing if the relationship is too toxic and, and somebody in the relationship maybe isn't ready or able to do the moving and it keeps being toxic. It's like, it doesn't have to be toxic, you know? And if you've got children, you have a responsibility to them too, that they grow up in an environment that's not toxic, so. I like the illustration of, of taking things out of a suitcase. And it, it just makes me think like the more that we do the work to pull certain stories and beliefs up out of ourselves, that's when we can look at them clearly and honestly with integrity and decide whether or not we want that to continue to be part of our story or if it needs to be, you know, not for me. <laughs> um, but if we're right. not, if we're not doing the work of pulling those things up and looking at them, that's when it can, that's when it can start to breed resentment and anger and disconnection in our relationships. And, and like you said, at the beginning of our conversation, like so many people, we've lost the ability to have these kinds of conversations with people. And so we're just like cut and run, you know, which, yeah. you know, when, when, when we talk about like a relationship ending, that can still be the result that happens after a good amount of work. <laughs> um, Absolutely. And, and I would always recommend that people do the work regardless um, uh, because if you don't do it now, you will do it later. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah. it's not going anywhere because everything, everywhere you go, there you are. <laughs> so you, you take all the stories with you wherever you go. And so the, the more that we can do the, the introspection and the self-awareness and develop the, the skill of having hard conversations and holding our beliefs very loosely, the better off all of our relationships are going to be. So that is, that is really practical and helpful advice. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and I did ask some of my, you know, social media, um, people, what kinds of things would they like me to talk with you about? And the, the one question that I got that I think is probably the only one that we have time for, um, 
centers around this idea of like how the question was, how do I help my transgender child Mm. know that they are loved and that they're okay when they also have heard the messaging through religious culture that they are bad. (laughs) And, and, and as we, as we talk about this a little bit more, um, it occurred to me the other day, why, and, and is so helpful as we're talking about the ways that within the political realm, people have capitalized on hot button topics in order to, to gain more traction with particular populations. And so, you know, some of the reason why LGBTQ, queer communities, transgender, all of that is like such a heightened thing is because it, it pushes on that button that for a lot of conservatives, like if we're talking about, (laughs) I'm, I'm trying to tie this all together here as, as we were talking about like the kind of obsession that many religious communities have with sex and sexuality. And we, and we're only thinking about sex as penis and vagina of course that is going to influence then the way that that people who are raised with that mindset are thinking about any relationship that is not heteronormative yes right so so as as we're talking about like this specific thing as a parent helping a child who doesn't fit into the Mm quote-unquote like heteronormative straight Mm -hmm. relationship kind of binary thinking and we can talk about this, not just as for a transgender child, but anybody that is, you know, gay, queer, asexual, neurodiverse, like, whatever. Yes, yep. yes, exactly. Like, how do we do this as parents with our children to unshame messaging that maybe they have already gotten from the time that they were little? Yeah, Oof, it's a heavy question. <laughs> it's a heavy question. And but it's a really important one. Um, We have remarkably high suicide rates in our youth and young adult populations for all kinds of reasons. One of the salient threads that I think you can find is that in places we are demanding that children, that them being a role, looking a particular way, acting a particular way, is more important than anything else about them. For some, it's the heteronormative message. For some, it's I have to get good grades and go to a big college and have to earn lots of money. For some, is I have to basically be a 30-year-old adult when I'm 10. The pressure that's on them. I have to do three sports. I have to da-da-da-da, whatever. No one seems to care about who are you as an authentic human who's unique, who's never been here on this earth before? If you have a child that has, is, has a strong sense of, of determination about themselves and you continue to squash that over and over and over again, shame it, tell it it's wrong, You can't be that way. You've got to like sports. You've got to do it this way, whatever it is. That child eventually is going to begin to express symptoms of depression, anxiety, um, resentment. And because their power differential in the home is so much Mm -hmm. less than that of those that are keeping them alive, their sense of why am I here begins to emerge. The suicidal ideation begins to emerge. So with gender identity, yes, it's true. The vast majority of people, what they're assigned at birth is what they feel like, right? But we have almost 2% of people that are intersex. Almost 2%. And then we have kids that what they're assigned at birth By the time they're three or four, and if they're a girl and they're not putting frillies on, or they're a boy and they're not turning a stick into a a gun, but instead they're going the other direction, right? The three-year-old boy is wanting frillies, wanting to be in a dance class, wanting whatever. And we start squishing that, they're going to be suicidal by 10. Hmm. 
So what do you really want for your children? Are they, do they need to be a reflection that you're good enough? Do they need to perform so that the world can see that you're good enough? Or were you given the privilege of raising a unique human that has never been on this planet before that is a miracle and you get to discover who they are, right? If you can't do that with your child and your child is strong-willed, they could likely be suicidal by 10. And you might not have them in your life at 18 or they're doing self-destructive things by the time they're 18, right? Like what's really important to you? Because if having a child that thrives makes a difference in the world, realizes how precious they are, is out there doing good things and knows that they deserve to do good things and that good things need to happen, then you need to study them. You need to provide the environment that is safe and protective and curious. Who are they? What's their bent? What do they love? You know, my two granddaughters are entirely different. All four of my kids, entirely different. They don't get, they never got parented the same because they didn't need the same things from us, right? I have queer kids, you know? Um, Watching them be their fullest self, nothing brings me more joy because they're out in the world loud and proud and doing great things, you know? And I get to be the one sitting and saying, I love how they're different from me. I love what they teach me. Like my life is made so much richer but I have strong-willed kids. If I had not figured out how to do that, now that they're adults, they wouldn't have relationships with me like they do mm. because they'd be like, I can't trust you. I can't trust you to see me, love me, listen to me, be curious about me. You just want me to be an expression of yourself. I'm not going to do that. Sorry, mom, love you, but no. And they would, be sh- they would have started shutting me out years ago, years ago. And that's what kids do. When we are getting mad at them for playing house or playing doctor at five, they just learn to go underground with their sexuality. We think that abstinence only education is protective. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we've driven our child underground. Now we know nothing that they're doing. And that in this world is dangerous. That's right. You need to be their primary resource. So you need to be like, oh, great question, honey. I don't know. Can we work on that one together? You know, like I want to be here for you, but I didn't grow up in this world exactly. So we're going to have to figure this out together, but man, I am up for the challenge because I don't want you alone out there in a way that doesn't feel safe for you. You know, it's like we have to rethink what we mean by what does it mean to be a good parent? Mm -hmm. You know, one of my kids had, had me read um, a book that came out not that long ago called, um, um, oh, what was it called? Um, Hunt, gather, parent, mm-hmm. hunt, gather, parent. And it was an NPR writer, um, writer, a journalist who felt like she was being destroyed by her three-year-old. Like she literally <laughs> could not figure it out. Like, she's like, this girl has me running. I'm crying. I'm falling apart. I can't do it. She ends up on an assignment where with some prim in some primitive villages and realizes that they're parenting entirely different than what people are doing Mm -hmm. in the States. So she decides to put together an assignment where she goes to, I think four or five different primitive villages in different countries, lives for three months each with her three-year-old. And she's like, we have got it all wrong now in the United States. And what she describes in this book that she learns, all these, tri- all these tribes and villages don't know each other. Like they're not, they don't have the kind of communication that we do. They're all parenting the same way. Mm. And the parenting that they describe is a parenting that we actually used to do years and years ago where we understood child development and we had kids doing with us the thing. We had them on the farm. Okay, I know what a two-year-old can do. So I'm going to give them this task. Be like, dang, good job. And I know they're not going to be able to do these other things well, right? But the older one can help the little one grow up in doing the things, right? And so we just keep exposing them and showing them that helping as a family is part of what we do. We're part of a community, right? It was really this brilliant book. And I thought, 
oh, you know what? My parents parented a lot that way. And it was because they were immigrants. My grandparents are immigrants. They brought that way of parenting. But what we're doing now, this helicoptering and doing for our kids what they can do for themselves, all we're telling them is life is easy. You should expect to get whatever you're going to get. And, and it should all come pretty easily for you. Hmm. And oh, by the way, I'm doing these things for you because I actually really don't believe in you. Because if I did, I'd stand back and say, gosh, that sounds hard. How do you think you might solve that? I think you can find a way, right? We would be giving the message, I believe in you, as opposed to, I don't think you can, you know? And so we have adult kids that are like, I I mean, unbelievably asking for things that you would never have asked. Like, I didn't make it to that. um, Oh, I had somebody yesterday say to me, Oh, you know, during the pandemic, you said if we couldn't do this thing live, we could, we can do it live at some, or we can maybe do it live in some other time in the next few years. Well, we're not doing that course anymore. So like, so she said, if, if I'd like to do it live when you do it again, I'm like, okay, that's right. She goes, and if you're not, how will you compensate me? And I thought, who said you get compensated for something (laughs) you already got and somebody was offering to give you more and now you want compensation for that offer mm. I don't I don't understand that but this thinking is super prevalent you talk to any college professor and they will tell you you know I wonder I wonder how much of that is is that so many of us are hyper aware of the criticism and the critical eye from other people that it boxes us in as parents and and strips our creativity and our curiosity with our own children because yeah. we have the expectations placed on us of like children behaving a certain way. And if we can't manage our own being okay Anxiety. with other people being mad at us or not understanding yeah. us or not approving yeah. of us, if we can't manage yeah. that, then, then that is what is going to create these yes. negative stifling relationships with our children. Like I've, I've seen that with, you know, you talked about your children being all different and I have three kids all very, very different. And my, my boy and my girl are, are, are flipped in many ways as far as their interests. And like, my daughter is super athletic. My son is super sensitive. And I mean, obviously those are two different areas, but, um, but it has been, I have noticed like what a challenge it is for me to listen to feedback from family, strangers, communities, educators about, about them and have to like buffer myself to say like, I can't listen to that. Like I have to listen to them and I have to, and I have to follow what is most aligned with my own integrity and my own conscience. And so I guess as a larger way to wrap up this conversation about sex and sexuality and parenting and unshaming is that it really boils down to our ability to listen to what's really happening on the inside, what's really happening beneath all of the layers of the shoulds and the stories from everyone else, what is actually happening in me. And in our most intimate relationships, we have to find language and find courage to express that part of ourselves. And when we do that, then we have the most amazing and connected relationships with other people, but it can't, yes. happen. it can't happen without doing that work. No, you, you really nail it so much there, Morgan, because it is that combination of we've got to do our work. We've got to listen and we've got to notice and we've got to deal right. And get clear and what's true. And if we have kids, we also have to put that much earnest listening mm. into them. And we have to be willing to ask ourselves, What's the right thing for this kid yeah. right now? And what's the right thing for this one right now? Not what are they saying out there? I can, I can remember saying to one of mine who lost everything, saying, baby girl, or maybe it was my son. I don't even remember now, but I remember it was one of them. And I said, if you leave the house without your coat, I want you to, or your lunch, I want you to know I will not be bringing it to school. Mm-hmm. Even if everyone thinks I'm the worst mother ever, Mm. it's not my learning. It's yours. And I need you to be uncomfortable enough to say, 
huh, what do I need to do in the morning so I remember my coat? What do I need to do in the morning so I remember my lunch? That's appropriate. You're 10 years old. That's appropriate. Yeah. And doing the exact same thing you're talking about, saying to myself, I know I got all these people that are going to be thinking like, <laughs> What kind of mother sends her child to school without a coat in Seattle when it's cold, you know, but I'd be like, that's not the best thing for that kiddo. It's not, Mm. I will not be helping them because, you know, it probably was my son, you know, a little bit more beautifully creative and in their mind, having a lovely time Mm. and, you know, a little more ADHD ish, Mm -hmm. you know, and doesn't, doesn't settle in and needed to learn the skills that he's going to need in order to be able to, you know, not forget so much. It is hard because it is, there's a lot of criticism out there. For sure. And I, I, to your point, exactly. Like I remember um, the day I had a light bulb moment with my daughter, she was probably, I don't know, nine or 10. And I said, go clean your room. And I walk by her door 15 minutes later and she's sitting on the floor and the room is exactly the mess that it was. And she's like reading a book. And I started to get so frustrated. Like, why isn't she just cleaning her room? And as I talked with her, I realized like she literally didn't know how to clean her room. And I was like, oh, like this right now is not her being deliberately, you know, rebellious or ignoring me or not listening to what I say, but she actually needs me to teach her the skills of cleaning her room. So I made her a list and I said, okay, well, first of all, you could gather all the books together and put them on a bookshelf, you know, second of all. And so I'm walking her through that. And, and I think often as parents, we neglect to teach our children the skills that they need in order to to do something. And, and it's very easy for us to also, you know, many people who listen to this podcast are already interested in self-development. Um, and it can be really easy, even in like the self-development area to get mad at ourselves for not knowing how to do something (laughs) and not being like further along in the path or the journey than we are. And often like we just, we haven't figured out yet the the basic skills that we need in order to to get to where we want to go in order to have the clean room, in order to have the better relationship, in order to have the healed trauma. And so Mm -hmm. some of this is just the hard work of teaching ourselves and learning from other people how to, how to build these skills, how to build the skills of introspection and awareness and how to build the skills of how to have hard conversations and how to be more confident and how to advocate for your own needs and and for yourself. And I love that being a parent is hands down the best way that I have learned how to heal parts of myself, how to heal, how to heal, how to heal little Morgan that felt yeah. so bad about being interested in sex. Cause I didn't think I was supposed to be, or, you know, like exploring my body and feeling dirty at the same time when I was like having a ball, you know, yeah, exactly. and so it's, just, it's, I love that, that we heal and we can, we, there's no place like a relationship where we can be hurt on the deepest levels. And there's no other place outside of relationships where we can be healed on those deep levels as well. Oh boy. That is so true. That's so true. Yep. Where, um, so people who, who want to learn more about the work that you do, obviously like your, your book shameless, um, is hugely available and, um, helpful to people who are parenting children through a different type of sexual ethic and conversations than, than many of us were raised in, but where else can people, people find you find the work that you do and, and connect with the, the message that you are sharing with everyone. Yeah. So I have a website that's Tina Shermer sellers.com. I and mean, then you can probably put that in the, in the show notes. Um, and on there, I have resources for folks. I have a thing called the sexual reclamation project, which actually allows you to walk yourself through your own sexual history story. If you want to learn in that way, um, you can download that for free. There's just all kinds of things there for you. Um, on Instagram, I'm Dr. Tina shameless. And, um, and, you know, we explore different kinds of issues, um, there we've been looking, um, more recently at, um, what's the research now saying about psychedelic assisted therapy, cause that's coming around the bend. And so I thought it'd be fun to talk about that for a while, but I think last spring, we really took apart the book, um, ejaculate responsibly, which mm. is an incredibly important book. And, uh, we spent about a month on that. That was pretty fun. Um, I also have an Instagram called 
Inanna, I-N-A-N-N-A, underscore rising, underscore P-A-T, which stands for Psychedelic Assisted Therapy. And this is a new organization that I'm starting for clinicians who are have now added as physicians or whatever, they've added psychedelic assisted therapy as one of the things that they're learning about or therapists who have. And I have a website that's inanarising.org. Um, to support people who are being brave and entering that healing space mm -hmm. to try to help relieve some of the trauma that there is around. Um, yeah. And then, and then people are always welcome to DM me and the books are there every two years, two to three years, I'll be updating the resources in shameless parenting. So it stays relevant every year um, at this, on the store tab of the Dr. Tina website, the information that's in shameless parenting can be downloaded as handouts hmm. for clinicians to use and clergy to use therapists to use educators to use. So if you are in the front lines and you're working with kids and parents, that's a place where you can download and you can have a license and you can run off as many as you want for eight year olds, nine year olds, 10 year olds, whatever you've got all the stuff. And it's on a front back page. It's, everything is there for them. Um, just to try to, I know that those professionals don't get the sexual health training that they need and want. And so this is a way to make their lives a little bit easier is to provide handouts that they can then use at parent teacher conferences or youth groups or, you know, well child visits or, you know, the therapist or whatever to help out. So those are on the store tab at the Tina Shermer sellers.com website. So those are just ways. Yeah. Awesome. So those of you who are listening in the, the show notes, so if you go to the particular episode and scroll down, you'll see links to all of this stuff at the bottom of that. So Dr. Tina, thank you very much for spending so much time with me today and for all of your hard earned wisdom in this area of um, sexual health and identity and relationships. It's all so important and is, is contributing to people being less lonely. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Morgan. It was a delight to talk to you about this and anytime I'm here to support Thank you. you. And, uh, and for my listeners before we go, PS. Yes.